Good afternoon. So we are going to talk to you uh, together with uh, Simon, uh, our surgeon partner, a little bit about augmented reality. So basically to quickly introduce myself, so I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins and uh, Technical University of Munich, actually more at Technical University of Munich, 80% currently and 20% at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I started AR back in 95 with industrial AR and I was leading a group of industrial and medical AR at Siemens Corporate Research until 2003. During those period, we also established the International Symposium on Mixed and Augmented Reality in 2000 and 2001 and have been in this field for many years. Today we, uh, we decided together with one of our surgeon partners, Simon, to talk about things that we have done and have been translated already into operating room or medical school. Uh, hopefully in the next years we talk to you about what we are doing today. But today we are mostly introducing things that have been already more or less transferred and uh, talk a little bit about their possible impact or the plans to bring them further, uh, I let Simon to introduce himself. Thank you, Nasir. Uh, my name is Simon. I am uh, working as a surgeon in the orthopedic trauma department here in Munich at the University Clinic uh, for 10 years. And I, had, uh, I was really lucky that from the start on I could work together with you, Nasir, because Nasir is a really a pioneer in the field of uh, medical AR. Um, and it's, um, well, the thing is that um, I operate every day nearly on trauma patients with broken bones. Uh, I love operating on spine and pelvis uh, especially. And uh, just like many of my fellow surgeons, I love new technology and I love new tools. Uh, so I think for me that was really a, a nice uh, thing to be able to work together on, on new stuff. So um, the, the thing is that you could would consider like fixing bones, like repairing a car in a care shop, just like it isn't. It's not the same. Uh, the patients are totally different, have different anatomy, different pathologies, and um, there are a lot of uh, delicate um, structures, just as vessels and nerve you don't want to hurt. So um, it's a very tense situation sometimes in the operating room. People are really focused, concentrated on, on what they do. So if you want to introduce new technology, it could be an issue, because it could disrupt the workflow. People would hate it, it would prolong the time, make things more complicated. So that's why when developing new technology for the operating room, it's really, really crucial to design it very well and uh, to closely collaborate between engineers and doctors. And we have that uh, lab that you can see on the slide. Uh, it's inside the clinic. That's where um, doctors and engineers meet. So it's kind of a meeting point for inventors of different specialties to get uh, the right solutions. We were working with HMDs from the start on doing augmented reality. Um, but when I came uh, a couple of years later, there was another smart augmented reality technology that was just about to be uh, ready to be introduced into the, to the operating room. Uh, so the first system that we developed, it was back when I was still at Siemens Corporate Research back in 98, 99. Uh, it was the invention of uh, camera augmented mobile CR. So at that time, there was a, a lot of move on head mounted display at Sony, Canon, and different places. Uh, and then what uh, I did after one of these meetings, I thought, okay, we put this double mirror or we put this prism to align the eye with the camera and inside the operating room, the eye of the surgeon is basically the x-ray when you do minimally invasive surgery. So I thought I can do exactly the same thing and co-align the camera with the x-ray source. And that was come, that came to the invention of that uh, camera augmented mobile C-arm like an HMD with an additional sensor of video, but this time X-ray is by construction co-registered with the, with the video. And after a few years of what you see here as the cadaver studies, we started, okay. uh, we brought it into the operating room, and I think Simon was one of the surgeons who actually did a lot of surgeries using that. At that time, I was within the first years of my training, and uh, we had this wonderful new, new tool, 
and we had the, um, received the certification to use it in the operating room. So we brought it to the operating room and doing operations with other senior surgeons. None of them was introduced to the system prior to surgery. It just said, there's a C arm, and they said, look what it can do. And we were super, like, seeing what they do with it and, and monitoring it. So it, the first thing it does help you is uh, placing the fluoro. So you exactly see the target area. So you know when you press the pedal, you know exactly know what you will get. Uh, the, ad the other thing is that it also helps you to place incisions, like this is a nail inside the bone and you want to exactly drill down that hole to put a screw into it, and so you don't have to waste more fluoros. Usually you make five, six, seven to get it right, and now it becomes really intuitive and much faster to do especially small incision surgery. Another um, thing that we did is we saw that um, patient is moving when we uh, manipulate on him. So we have this small marker that you can see in the upper right corner that helps you get a glimpse of like if the tracking is still good or not. So the machine tells you maybe you should update with a new floral or maybe it's still good enough to do what you want to do. So this is um, another very nice idea. You see a distal radius fracture. It's very, very common. It helps you to place the incision with a pen directly over the um, of the fracture, minimizing the, fra the incision length, minimizing the trauma, and also it helps you to reduce fractures. Like this, you have this K wire, you put it into the fracture, and then you move it around, and what you see now is you can almost cannot see the fracture anymore. Usually that's kind of a 10 picture thing you have to do, and now you only have to take one picture and you get it right. So it's very intuitive, reduces time, reduces uh, uh, radiation. We really liked it. Uh, one thing you notice when you look at the image is that uh, obviously the x-ray is just a layer over the video image, so that means it can, can potentially block the view onto uh, vulnerable structures. Uh, it's called inattention blindness, and um, uh, of course I asked, like, I really would love to have that uh, improved because there's a lot of space it includes without really helping me. So to tell that for that, I think this is a problem which is in general in the whole field of augmented reality. In the last five years, finally, the community got augmented reality as a hype and everybody is interested, but still majority of them, in terms of visual, think augmented reality as overlay. But augmented reality as overlay will not be doing the job. Because in fact, for several reasons, one of them, as uh, Simon was telling, is relevance. I, if you put a lot of data on top of each other, you may lose the, the information that you need in each of them. So you have to capture from each modality what is really relevant and then combine them appropriately to get a real augmentation which does not decrease your performance but increases your performance. In this case, we did a very simple thing with, with machine learning, finding out it's automatically detecting each of the objects, each pixel belonging to each of the modalities, and intelligently deciding what has to be in front, what has to be back, what has to be mixed with which percentage. Do I want to see through it? Do I, do I want to see it on top? Do I want to uh, hide it? So this allows a real fusion. So for me, this is augmented reality. Overlay does not simply represent what we would call augmented reality, is intelligent relevance-based augmentation where the data is intelligently mixed. Simon talked about our previous work on HMD. This is about 12 years ago. We brought our head-mounted display in a surgery conference, and then they could see the volume rendering uh, of CT of uh, one of the uh, persons here who had a, a, a ski accident, therefore we had a CT, and then they could see on top of it. They were very, very excited. They could also interact with that and combine their uh, slice view and the volume rendering view. The, uh, the subject could move uh, rigidly and it, will, it still would be valid. They were very, very interested. But then compared to the other system of CAMC that we showed at the beginning, their success rate of executing the M nail or the surgery was lower. And the reason is exactly that overlay is not giving you the right depth perception. So we did a lot of work in those days 
to instead of doing the overlay that I showed you right now, to do a perceptual overlay. Here we are using human perceptual cues of depth, including a parallax, including the fact that you, if you look in front of a flat window, you expect to see through it, but when you are tilted to that, you expect more and more not to see through it, and also the fact that we keep high curvatures alive, so you see a ghost of the object. So you start to see feeling that you're seeing inside the object. And then we started to use some very funny effect of human. We are tracking, in this case, the endoscope, the laparoscope, and then we create a virtual shadow which goes across the virtual and real. And in your mind, it connects the virtual to real, so you feel that the CT and the patient, they're both in the same actual space. But now the question I was ask, always asking uh, Simon is, okay, if I move this towards HMD, if we bring it to the operating room, this is actually, these are uh, Alex Johnson and Greg Osgood, the head of trauma in Johns Hopkins, and Alex Johnson, a very experienced surgeon. They started to use HoloLens inside the operating room, mostly for positioning the the x-rays, uh, that the many x-rays they were taking at the right position when the x-ray was taken, and then do their operations. They have an IRB to use the uh, HoloLens during the surgery. The question I was always asking Simon is, is it easily accepted inside the, I mean, for others, we are not as advanced than you and, you know, as you and uh, uh, Osgood or Alex Johnson? Well, the thing is that uh, once you become a very experienced surgeon, you did that like, maybe for, like, for, for many, many years, like 20, 30 years, so you have your way of doing things. And now there's new technology that proposes you to do something better, but requires you to change your workflow. So obviously it's a cultural change that always is being connected to introduction of new technology in the operating room. So what we think is that usually, like it has happened in the past, change comes with the new generations, the ones that are not established yet. So uh, in, uh, from all of you, it also starts with the training of, of students or young doctors. What you can see here is a simulated surgery. So this is a kind of a phantom patient. So nothing is real, even the CT is just a paperboard. There's vital signs which are being generated by the computer. There's a haptic device that gives you the feeling of bone and you can then introduce this instrument into the spine to carry out a procedure which is injecting cement to stabilize a fracture. All this thing is really big because we want to not only uh, um, teach dexterity but also like have the whole immersive simulation going. And that is the, the way in the future how to train doctors. Like in the aviation, nobody would train the pilot on a real, real plane, right? So, but the problem here is that it requires a lot of setup to, um, to do it right, uh, to create the immersion. And what we are working on now is we integrate all those big things and the machines and the patient in, in augmented reality. So with the help of a head-mounted display, you can just augment the room and still have like a tiny simulator, but the whole room becomes your own operating room. And things can even move in, in augmented reality. So you see the operator, the uh, moving uh, device, and then moving the C-arm to get the right trajectory to, to get the X-ray. So that is a very interesting application to use it in training. And this would allow you to bring it wherever you want. So you, be, you really need them. We want to have things that you touch. It should still be there, but the rest could be virtual, could be through augmented reality. But with Simon, we also decided to bring it even earlier into medical education, to make the next generation addicted to augmented reality. So we have a big project with 800 students of the first year of medical school in Munich, together with Professor Vashke, and they are using this uh, magic meter for, uh, for education and for training of first year and second year medical students. So they, with the left hand, with the right hand, they can actually localize the position of the augmentation. With the left hand, they can see the details, different details from vasculatures to bone, to muscles, they can play around with those data. So we leave another few minutes for questions if you have, and we would, of course, like to thank a lot of surgeons, a lot of creative engineers, a lot of active surgeons and colleagues who have participated in many years to create uh, what you saw. 
There are many other things that we are not showing. We only had 12 minutes. So hopefully in the next years, you will see uh, a lot of more things in this direction. But if you have any questions, both Simon and I, um, I are here to answer you, whether from medical side or uh, engineering side. Please go ahead.